Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads TV. My name is Arya Cohen Wade, and I'm your host today for our conversation with Juliet Lapidos. Uh, Juliet, could you introduce yourself? I'm Juliet Lapidos, as Arya said. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic, and I just published a book last week called Talent. Um, I have that book right here. It's a re- really great cover. It, was this is this a pre existing piece of art, or did they did they do this for? No, they. Uh... A little brown did it, or I think they actually outsourced it. I now I can't remember the name of the artist, but they are pretty great in my opinion. Yeah, it's I mean it's very simple, but like it, it's it's evocative. Yeah. So and this is a novel. Um, uh, usually when I talk to an author, it's a nonfiction book, um, <laughs> but this is a novel. I'm um, happy uh, to talk about a novel. Um, so thanks for coming on. Uh, you were on this show a couple years ago, uh, a previous conversation. We talked about. Um, I was thinking about it because we t- you wrote a piece back then about. Um, uh, if once you start a book, you always finish a book. Oh yeah, actually, that was for the Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking, I was thinking about that. I was like, well, you know, I will finish this one anyway. But I, I, I was <laughs> thinking, like, you know, in your in your honor, even if I wasn't wasn't feeling it. But I, I, I liked I liked it a lot, and it's it's interesting. It's not exactly what I was expecting. Um, and I think we have a fair amount to talk about. Okay, so I guess the first question is, um, what can you give us? Kind of a brief. <laughs> uh, you know, intro to, to what the, what this novel is about. Yeah, I actually, I still struggle with this, uh, years after finishing it. Um, yeah, public, the publishing industry takes a while. So I, it was done like, you know, two years ago, a distant memory now. Um, so the, uh, the title is a reference more or less to the parable of the talents which is um, like all parables, I guess, from the New Testament. And um, I'll just very quickly summarize it as a way to launch into the book. Sure. So um, in the parable, there's a master who uh, is probably a stand-in for God or for Jesus. And uh, he's going away on a business trip. So he entrusts his property to three servants um, in the form of talents, which is a unit of money. So he gives one servant, um, I believe it's 10 talents, although I forget the exact amount, uh, the second servant, say, five talents, and the third servant, one talent. And um, then he goes away on his trip, comes back, and he asks the servants what it is that they did with the money that he gave them. Uh, The first servant invested the talents and did very well. You know, let's say he doubled his money or something like that. The second servant also did very well. And the third servant confesses that he buried his talent in the ground because he was worried about what the master would do to him if he lost the money. Uh, and the, ma- the master is very angry, and he, um, he, he says he, he expected the, the servant to invest it. And so um, he punishes the servant by taking that one talent away from him and giving it to the most successful servant, the first servant. Uh, so when I read this parable a long time ago now in college, um, it struck me as very unchristian um, in the original sense of that word. I mean, I'm Jewish, so I guess, like, what do I know about Christianity? Uh, but I think of Christianity as the sort of, um, like, the first will be last and the last will be first sentiment. And this is the antithetical to that. It's like the last will be last and then some because I'm going to take what you have and give it to the most successful person. And the fact that we're talking about units of money makes it seem even more unchristian, that um, it's basically a usury situation. Uh, So I thought about this a lot and what the meaning of it is, which most directly is that you have to do something with what you're given. Um, And if you don't, there's nothing good about that. Uh, So the book is in lots of ways a meditation about this, what it means to have talent, um, what talent even is, um, what you're supposed to do with your gifts. so that's all a little abstract, and more concretely, the setting is a um, a city that's basically New Haven, although I call it uh, New Harbor, and a university that's pretty much Yale, although I call it something different um, for reasons of creative license. Um, and the main character is a grad student who um, has been in grad school for way too long, and she's having trouble finishing her dissertation, which is on a history of inspiration and what this concept is. And um, she thinks that inspiration basically doesn't exist, that what leads people to create art is just discipline. It's just working like any other kind of human endeavor. Uh, but she, she is unable to finish her dissertation. And then she 
meets this woman named Helen Langley, who's the niece of a famous author named Frederick Langley. And um, Langley had this kind of odd career arc where he was really productive as a young man. He wrote three books, and then suddenly he stopped writing. Um, and Helen informs the main character, whose name is Anna, that um, in fact, at the end of his life, he started writing again. He started writing in these notebooks. Um, and there's a dispute between the university and Helen about the status of these notebooks, about who owns them. So Anna, the grad student, gets kind of drawn into this and ends up thinking she can use the notebooks to finish her dissertation. Uh, so that's that's the summary in a nutshell, probably. Hard to follow. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's a campus novel. Um, it's kind of a mystery novel in some ways. Um, it's kind of a postmodern novel um, because you have, uh, quote, you know, you have excerpts from the... Uh, the diaries of uh, Frederick Langley uh, okay. in the text, and you have some footnotes that <laughs> uh, the kind of thing that doesn't usually appear in a novel. Uh, so it's an interesting mixture of, of things um, going around. So, I, I, so just on the ta- so getting back to the talents for a moment. So I I had heard what this was, but I, I like you, I'm Jewish and didn't grow up reading the New Testament, um, so I didn't really know what it was. And then when I uh, saw that your book is inspired by this parable, I read it, and yeah, it, it is. Uh, harder to comprehend, I guess, than, so, than like the prodigal son or something. Um, right. And I mean, on the, the so the surface level, not taking like the metaphor, you have like a kind of praise of like you know like usury, which it seems weird for Jesus to be doing because he famously yeah. didn't like the money lenders, and and yeah, and then the the poor guy who was just like couldn't think of what what to do with his. Um, you know, like I, I think of it as almost like a chunk of metal or something. I don't know if that's yeah. accurate. You know, but he buries it in the ground, and then he he gets like abraded and almost like cast into hell because of, because of what he did. So that, so that seems very harsh. And then on the metaphorical level, is it yeah? Is it talent? Is th- these things are called talent? Is it like belief um, that he cares about? Is it like good works? Uh, it, it's all it's all mysterious to me. So I guess so. The question is, um, did you did you have this idea for for writing a you know campus novel, and then the idea of, of bringing uh, the parable of the talents in as sort of like a structure or inspiration came that way, or you were just like thinking a lot about this parable and saw a way to you know metaphorically translate it into like uh, our contemporary uh, life. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, I guess the answer is a little bit of both. I I guess initially I didn't set out to write a campus novel exactly. It was always set in New Haven because when I started thinking about the book, I was very close to um, very close to college. And so that that was the context that I knew. Um, although I never did a PhD, unlike the main character. So that makes it completely different, of course. Um, (laughs) But um, I'd I'd had some ideas for things that I wanted to happen in a novel, including the like a dispute over somebody's posthumous work, um, and then yeah, I kind of put that together with the with the parable of the talents idea. Um, and, and at this point, you know, I, I I started the book in earnest in 2011, and I really can't remember a lot of what I wanted at the time. Like I knew it had something to do with the parable of the talents and I knew it had something to do with New Haven and I knew it had something to do with a character who was kind of stalled out for various reasons. And somehow those things came together. But I don't, but I do have like a little bit of a chicken and the egg foggy memory of like really what came first. Um, so yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't know if I can answer that honestly anymore. Okay. Well, that's interesting considering that the idea of inspir- literary inspiration is, is key to the novel. Yeah. That you can't remember exactly what your, uh, w- you know, which, which idea came first. So, um, uh, viewers who remember you from a previous appearance on the show, remember that we knew each other a little bit in college. Um, and, you so the main character. This is yeah set in New Harbor, Connecticut, which uh, is very <laughs> seems somewhat similar to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and but the character, yeah. When I was reading this, you know, like a first novel, traditionally it's like a semi autobiographical, or maybe it starts in childhood or something. And this this is not that, but it was also like, well, you know, is your 
is Anna you? I, like, I kind of know you a little bit. I know what you look like. <laughs> what I'm picturing the, the, the uh, goings on in my mind's eye, like, mm-hmm. is, is Juliet the person I'm, I'm thinking of? So I guess, you know, how did you conceive of the, of the main character? And is it, a, is it a version of you? Is it someone you created, you know, uh, out of nothing? Uh, what, what, what was the artistic process there? Yeah, I mean, we, the main character and I share some thoughts, but I think we don't share a disposition. Um, I mean, the, the main character's like central, the, the thing that defines her at this point in her life is that she, she can't really get any work done. Um, and that's never really been a problem for me. Like I'm a very disciplined person. She's not a very disciplined person. Um, but I guess procrastination kind of interests me conceptually and writer's block kind of interests me conceptually. And I guess I can say that the way the character is, is sort of what I worried I might turn into if I went to grad school. Mm. Um, so in that way, we're, we're similar and not. It's like this fear I have of what I might be like. Uh, but there are lots of ways in which we are also not alike. I mean, this character is much wealthier than I am, for example. Like, she has a trust fund that she inherited from her grandfather. I, sadly, do not have a trust fund inherited from a grandfather or anybody else. Um, so she has a, she, she was born into financial comfort in a way that I was not. Um, and that's also, I guess, something that interests me, like people who don't have to work for a living really, um, which is not, uh, which again, like I have to work for a living like most of us. Um, so yeah, she, she's more like things that interests me, interest me than things that I really am. Um, but some, and then some of her thoughts about academia are kind of like exaggerated versions of, of, um, things I worried about, about academia. Mm Um, so let's, let's talk about, um, the fictional author who appears in this novel or he's, he's no longer alive (laughs) during this novel, but his, his work is the central concern of the novel. Um, and that's, uh, Freddie Langley. Um, how... Yeah. So, why? How did you decide that this kind of um, it's not it's not exactly a book within a book, but it's like a text within a text will be part of it? And how did you conceive of of this character of Langley? Um, right. So, right. So, as you were saying, like the the. The, to the extent that the book is sort of a mystery, that part of the question is like, well, why did this guy stop writing? And then why did he start again at the end of his life? And what is the status of the of what he was working on at the end of his life? Did he intend it for public consumption or not? And if he didn't, why not? Um, and that, again, is just something that um, I, I found sort of interesting as a, as a concept. I mean, so, some of the things that were bubbling in the air, like when I had started working on this, was that... Um, Nabokov's last novel, um, called, I think the original of Laura, um, had been sitting in like a vault in Switzerland for, since Nabokov had died, um, in the form of like a stack of note cards. And, um, apparently he had told his son, Dimitri, that he never wanted anything to happen with these note cards. It was totally unfinished. And Dimitri, for whatever reason... He he said to burn them, I I believe. Pardon? Um, Nabokov told his son to burn them, or, or his right. wife to burn yes. them. Yes, yeah. He, um, he wanted them destroyed. Um, and Dimitri ended up not obeying his father's wishes, and the, and the notebooks were, uh, the note cards were turned into a book and then published. Um, I don't remember exactly when now. It was like during, I think, the first Obama administration, so roughly yeah. around. Um, and that interested me, that conflict of. Um, you know, the kind of the son betraying the father, but also the, you know, the status of posthumous work. And, and, and in a way, this is kind of a familiar story. Kafka's manuscripts, Kafka didn't want them um, to be public. And then his executor uh, decided to make them public. And, and I believe what the executor's stance was, was basically like, it, you know, it's Kafka. The, the, the world being able to read this stuff is more important than what Kafka's wishes were. And besides, if he'd really wanted this stuff to be destroyed. He should have just done it himself. He shouldn't Mm -hmm. have made me do it. Um, So those were some of the things that I was thinking about. Um, And then that tied into interests, that kind of academic interests I'd had since school about um, 
how to, how to figure out what an author's intentions are and whether those intentions matter at all. Um, I think we, we were both educated at a time when the, the standard line was still kind of like, it doesn't matter what the author's intentions are. And more than that, it's like a little unsophisticated to care what the author's intentions are. Like the author doesn't really matter. What matters is the text and sophisticated readers like divorce biography from what they're reading so that they can do a close reading. Um, and this is, I think, kind of charming, but also a little bit ridiculous to, to just pretend the author doesn't exist. Um, and I guess to me that that stands in for a lot of other things we, we do in daily life, you know, like how we interpret what other, what other people's intentions are, whether it matters what somebody's intentions are when we respond to them. So, um, Hopefully, if the book conveys anything, it, it's it it or it raises a lot of these questions. You know, how how do we interpret books? How do we interpret what other people do? Um, can we do this reliably? Um, do we often do this too much? You know, like do we take a book that is actually kind of straightforward and then we make up a lot of stuff about what it might actually mean because we see some benefit to ourselves in doing that or we think it's fun when in fact the book is straightforward or the person's intentions are straightforward or alternatively, like totally unknowable. And so we just have to fill in what the book means or what the person wants. Yeah, and um, I think one of the characters mentions the death of the author uh, in, the, in your book. Yeah. And then I was thinking, well, um, Julian is not dead. In fact, I'm talking to her very soon. Um, so I could ask her whatever, <laughs> whatever I want. She can tell yeah. me the real answer. Um, yeah, but I think... Uh, yeah, the, I think I don't... I don't I, the, this problem is... Like, I don't think there'll, there'll ever be a, a real solution for it. Um, so did you, was there, did you have a like kind of real life, like analog for Langley's character or did you kind of? Yes. Build, build yes. Them? And no, like um, a lot of people have asked me if, um, if I was thinking of J.D. Salinger and I sort of wasn't not thinking of J.D. Salinger. Like, there are certain things about Salinger that are like this character. Like, they both lived in the kind of mid-century, uh, or both produced their work in the mid-century. Um, and Salinger famously, you know, wrote four books, was just probably the most popular author at a certain moment, uh, like, totally celebrated. And then... Um, from his own account, just was kind of disgusted by that. And he didn't, he didn't want to be famous. Um, and he left the public eye very dramatically and never published again. And so uh, the way I think about this character is that one possibility is that he was like Salinger and that he was um, averse to fame. And he, he had this kind of, at, at one point, the character describes it as a possible kind of Buddhist aversion to fame. Um, but maybe not, like maybe the answer is actually something different. So I, I think Salinger was one possible um, like type for what this person is, but hopefully it's clear that that's not definitely the type that he is. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, someone who, you know, go like just stops publishing entirely, like, like Salinger is the um, paradigmatic person. Um, so... So since, as you know, um, the author is not dead, the author is right here, I want to ask you a question about, um, that I'm always kind of interested in reading a novel. How did you come up with the names of your characters? So Anna Brisker is the main character, and then Frederick Langley and the niece Helen Langley um, are the other two kind of main characters. How did you um well, with those? So in the case of um, the, the first name I had was, uh, was Frederick Langley. And that is because, as I joke about at one point, Langley is in, like, Langley, Virginia, like the FBI. Mm -hmm. Wait, not the FBI. The CIA. CIA. Um, because there's, a, there's some sort of, like, detective work and a comparison at one point between um, the kind of work that spies do and the kind of work that critics do. So I liked Langley as a name for him for that reason. And then Frederick, frankly, was just, like, I was just trying to think of a – kind of old timey, slightly old timey name that I didn't know any, I don't know anybody named Frederick. So I was like, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Sounds kind of old and I don't know anybody named that. Um, Helen, I don't really remember why I called her Helen. I think I just liked it. And then I'm glad you asked me this because most of the other characters in the book, uh, they're, they're simply introduced alphabetically. So Anna Brisker is A, B, 
and then her professor is C D. Huh, okay. Um, and then the next two characters are E and E, and I just went kind of in order. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, you have because one of the excerpts from Langley's journal is a little paragraph in which a bunch of characters are named are named alphabetically like that. Exactly. Um, okay, yeah. so you know uh, the the wordplay, you know, playing with names like orthography stuff. Uh, the epigraph from your book is um, from Frederick Langley himself, and I want you know when I was going through it, I was like, well, I don't know who this is, but I'll just keep going. Um, mm-hmm. And you mentioned Nabokov already, so uh, is this book a Nabokovian <laughs> tome? In no, I don't think enough about myself to like possibly claim that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, I've read a lot of new books. And, and, I mean, I was trying to kind of entertain myself. And um, I like books that have little puzzles in them like that. Um, that have, uh, I think in television, they're called, like, goose eggs, right? Easter eggs. Easter eggs. Goose Easter. <laughs> um, or maybe not just in television. But, yeah, I, I, I think it's fun when there are things like that in a book. And, um, I mean, since since part of what the book is kind of mulling is in thor- authorial intention and whether it matters. Um, it, it's supposed to kind of play into that, that there are, there are things that um, are there simply so that I can show my hand. And so like the names are one of them and there are certain correspondences between the notebook and the main text that are, again, if, if there's a point, it's just to be like, here I am, you know, um, and in fact, like p- part of the reason I decided not to call the city New Haven and the University of Yale, even though it should be fairly obvious that that's what those are, is again, just to be like, I made a decision. And so the fact that this is obvious makes people think about the decision. That's it. I mean, that's even more Nabokovian because he would have characters pop up for a little cameo named, um, you know, Vivian Darkbloom. Right. And other such things, which was an anagram for Vladimir Nabokov. And right. there's a um, famous motif in one of the middle novels, maybe Ben Sinister, where there's a footprint shape on the on the ground that's like in, in like the road, and it fills with water, so it's like reflecting. And this is like oh, I don't remember the, that. This is yeah. like the author's uh, Nabokov himself's imprint. Um, are there any other writers who you thought you were thinking about when you um, were writing the book? I mean, there's some David Foster Wallace, I think, in the in the footnotes at least. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I don't know. I mean, I've read, um, Infinite Jest. So beyond that, I'm like not a David Foster Wallach complete, completist. So I, um, I don't feel like I can talk about him with any authority. I mean, the, the footnotes, it's also like, it's an academic novel. So I thought it was sort of appropriate to have footnotes in it, or I don't know if it's appropriate, but that was kind of part of the thinking. And then, um, yeah, it was a way to introduce some information, that I didn't want in the narrative proper for various reasons. Um, so it was kind of a shortcut maybe. Um, when, so when I was in school, I actually worked on, um, I didn't work on any 20th century stuff. I worked on the 18th century. I worked on Henry Fielding. And, um, I mean, this book doesn't read at all like an 18th century novel. That would be crazy. But, um, one of the things that interested me about Fielding was that I felt that, he was constantly trying to guide the reading experience of the novel and that he was very controlling so that um, at the start of each book of Tom Jones, there's this like essay about the form of the novel or it's about the essays are on lots of things, but some of them are about formal matters. And he often addresses the reader directly as, as dear reader. Um, And um, it, it seemed to me that he, he didn't like the idea of letting go that, um, you know, just like these random people could just read his novel and make of it what they wanted. He was like, no, you need to read it this way. (laughs) Um, and, um, that as a reader interested me, like the feeling of somebody trying to guide me, which Nabokov definitely does. And there's a handful, maybe more than a handful of writers who that seems to be one of their concerns. That's like one of their, preoccupations as a writer is attempting to control the reading experience. Um, so I, I guess I did a little bit of that. Um, although I don't know, you know, I would guess that a lot of it, the way most people read, I don't think most people read that closely and that's not a criticism. Like people just read fiction for pleasure or, you know, 
uh, because they're on a plane and the Wi-Fi is not working or whatever. So I don't expect most people to notice this stuff, but I did it for my own pleasure in some ways, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, there's a part in the novel where um, you have a kind of a life hacker productivity guru give a lecture and uh, and the Anna is not receptive to this and and other parts of yeah it's kind of other parts of the novel are kind of like well why should you like can't you just like kind of give up and not not do all this stuff and she, you know the main character Anna says she um, she really wants to be like an emeritus emerita professor more than a professor where she can just kind of pat around like in a <laughs> you know like a dressing gown and like read right. books and uh, yeah. but doesn't really want to do the work yeah and, and so this I think kind of ties with the um you know, the slave who buried his talent and didn't want to work really hard to, to double his amount of money. Um, what, yeah, can you talk, are there, do you have any further thoughts on productivity and life hacking and stuff like that than, that's not not in the book? Yeah, I mean, I guess part of, part of the, in a way, that scene is the most, like, directly satirical of just that there's just this whole industry right of people who make money telling other people how to be productive and and um i do think sometimes the suggestions are just um absurd and and sometimes a little lifeless as if as if every the, just i guess the thought of organizing your life in order to be as efficient as possible is a little bit depressing to me um just like try to you know squeeze out as much of your day as possible in order to produce something that you could sell you know <laughs> um it's just a little sad and it seems to me it, it's sort of like a heightened kind of americanism it's like the america that europeans think is there but isn't always there but um you know, I know. I guess I know some from some French people who really do have a very stereotypical view of Americans as like Americans just identify too much with their work. You know, they their their whole identities are wrapped up in their work. Um, and I do think there's some there's a little bit of truth to that caricature. Um, that I do think we're kind of preoccupied as a nationality or whatever you want to say with just with producing, and that's where we find our self worth. So that's some of the stuff that I was um, that I was thinking about, and that and that sometimes I think there, there's almost like a radicalism in not being efficient, of just taking yourself out of the rat race and being like, I'm just not going to be efficient. I'm going to take my time doing this. I'm going to do it in a leisurely way. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that it's kind of classist. It's like if you need to work for a living, then you have sort of no choice but to be efficient and to work all the time. Um, whereas if you're wealthy you can do this kind of radical thing of removing yourself from the workforce and the preoccupation of efficiency. So it's not like a straightforward thing. Um, but these are some of the things I think about, I guess, you know, like the, how nice it is at times to remove yourself from, from these demands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, so Langley, um, removes, you know, he stops working as well. And one of the questions of the novel is like, what, does, you know, what happened that, um, that caused him to do that? Um, so let me see. Uh, okay. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the, like the scholar and the artist, which is another one of the themes of the book. And, you know, uh, the English PhD student is analyzing the work and the, the author is, is creating the work. Um, this, I felt like this book was not very favorable to English PhD students in yeah. general. Um, I don't know if they would enjoy reading this. Um, so yeah, what, what, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, my opinion of that world is not as negative as the characters for sure. Like I, I mean, I thought a lot about doing that with my life and I know a lot of people who have, and I think it's kind of great if you can make it work, like what a nice life reading books and interpreting them. Although of course that's, I don't, I think that's rarely what the daily life of an academic is. Like it's often more to remove like your, you're interpreting other people's interpretation of the primary source. Um, you know, you read a lot of secondary work. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, the, the relationship between a, a critic or a scholar and an author interests me in that um, the dependency that the critic or scholar has on the author in order to further their career 
um, to like use the source text in order to advance your argument and your argument is what will um, like help you make a living or not. Um, and uh, one of the characters suggests that this is a parasitic relationship, which I think is a harsh way of putting it, but on the other hand, it is a parasitic relationship. It's like you need the text and you need to feed off of it and then say something original about it in order to have something to show for yourself. Um, and I think that this can be very uncomfortable for the creator, the idea that there's like all these, that there is an industry devoted to using what you've done in order to further their careers. Um, and again, that's kind of a negative way of looking at it. And I'm sure, I think a lot of people like having critics look at their work and, and you know, dream of having um, like scholars devoted to figuring out what it is you were trying to say. Uh, but I guess that's a question of disposition, whether you think it's flattering or whether you think it's kind of crazy and annoying. Yeah, well, what do you, I, that was another one of my questions. What do you think? Have you been yeah. reading reviews? Um, how do you feel about people telling you what they thought of your book? Um, I guess, uh, I, you know, I find it awkward to hear what people think about the book. Um, I don't quite know how to respond to it. Um, there was one review in the Washington City paper that where I felt like I was very pleasantly surprised just because I thought that the person really, I forget the critic's name now, but I was like, oh, he really engaged with the book and he put it in this kind of interesting context and um, he, yeah, he, he, he read it kind of seriously and he had things to say about it that I thought were smart and he, he put it in a context I hadn't really thought of and I was like oh this is like a great experience and and like I even agree with his criticisms like he's right some of these conversations you know are not particularly natural um, but uh, in, you know I guess it says something about this moment for literature or something that a lot of the reviews are not actually reviews they're sort of like paragraph blurbs that basically describe the book um, and, uh, you know, as like part of a roundup of new things. And so they're, they're not engaging with it. Um, and it's always nice to be included with those things, but it is, it's hard to react to because it's just like you're um, like kind of a boilerplate summary of what the book is or what the publicist decided the book was, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just getting back briefly to the, you know, the uh, English literature PhD students, you have um, characters saying that they, you know, they can't read for pleasure anymore um, because they're spending, you know, they spend all their critical faculties on reading uh, critically. And, uh, you know, that seems very, like, you know, having the, the uh, joy sucked out of the process entirely. And I, you know, I became an English major basically because it was the thing I liked the most. Um, right. Don't know if that was the best... Uh, you know, uh, financial economic decision, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I, I didn't think, and I, you know, I thought a little bit about English grad school, grad school, but realized that like I couldn't apply like that, like the concentrated focus that would be necessary to like a single topic. Um, and it would, it would drive me crazy. Um, so. I mean, I should say that I, um, I actually found it really pleasurable in a lot of ways to read in that way. Like I like reading closely and I thought, I always thought that was kind of fun. I, I can't say I found the process of coming up with arguments and writing essays fun exactly, but I, I never really lost pleasure in reading and um, I've never wanted to join a book club for various reasons, but I, I miss the classroom experience. Like I miss um, like engaging in that way with a book that other people are engaging with at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I do, I do as well. Um, did, so did you, so I, when I, when I read uh, either on Facebook or Twitter that you had, um, uh, that you were publishing a book, I was like, whoa, whoa, that's really cool. But I was also like, well, I, I guess I never thought you would be the, the fiction writer type. I thought you would, you would probably write it like a nonfiction book if you were going to write a book. Um, right. so, but you know, I didn't know you very well. Uh, but did you always want, have the, in the back of your mind that you wanted to write fiction? What, you know? Why why a novel first instead of something yeah. else when your kind of your pro professional career has been mostly like opinion journalism and stuff like that? Right. Um, yeah, frankly, it was like a childhood aspiration. It's sort of like as long as I've wanted to do anything, I've wanted to write 
fiction, but it's just at, at some point, um, there, for a long time, I didn't think about it actively, but I guess it was always in the back of my mind. So through most of college, I thought that I would go on to get a PhD and become an academic. And so I didn't think primarily about writing fiction, and I never took a creative writing class. I didn't go on to get an MFA or anything like that. Um, but it, it was something I always wanted to do and had sort of told myself I would do eventually. And then um, when, I, when I started writing, it was basically like, well, if I'm ever going to do this, I guess I have to start. And so, you know, and so I did. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for my career, it probably would have made a lot more sense to find some nonfiction uh, topic, um, something to report on or some big argument to make. Um, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't my primary. Interest. And, and out, you know, outside of work, I continue to mostly read fiction. So like, um, you know, for my work at the Atlantic, I read a ton of news and I read magazine stories. Um, but in my like private life and my leisure, I've always read fiction. And since you are um, in your professional life working with words, whether writing or editing, uh, throughout the day, how did you, like, when did you find the time to actually do the writing? Uh, in, how did you fit it in? Weekends before having a child were really very useful. Um, yeah, it was mostly weekends and then, you know, the occasional night or, um, like, a stolen hour or two at my desk, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, so you you published a couple pieces recently that are kind of connected to the book, uh, non nonfiction pieces. Um, yes. So one was in the New Yorker. Uh, the title is "The Unadaptable Me," and it's about. Um, well, why don't, you, why don't you say what it's about? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's about if Hollywood comes knocking knocking on your door, or are you you know people asking you. Are you writing this book just so it can get right. options for a screenplay? No, I should say Hollywood has not come knocking on my door, and I don't expect it to. Um, the the piece is about the odd experience of when um, when I first uh, sold the book, and and then like in the year and a half since before it came out, um, if it if it came up in conversation that I had a book coming out, that I had a novel coming out, that a lot of people asked if. Um, if it had been optioned, if I wanted it to be optioned, um, and sort of related questions, like if um, basically fishing around to know if I had written the novel as kind of like a stepping stone to get Hollywood's attention, or you know, would I use this as a kind of like writing sample to try to get in a writer's room kind of thing. And, and um, as I say in the piece, uh, p- people were certainly, I assume, I think they were trying to be nice, um, or, or in some cases they were trying to be nice, and in other cases it was just like a cultural assumption. It's like the reason that somebody would do this today is in order to write television, because television is the way that most people engage with fiction now. Um, but I did not write this in order to get a career in Hollywood, and um the the thought of the book becoming a movie was like the farthest thing from my mind. As you say, there's like footnotes in it. It would be di- a difficult book, I think, to turn into a movie. And, um, you know, unless the director had like a really specific idea for how to do it, it would probably also be a pretty boring movie, I think, you know. Uh, it's just like not that kind of book. Um, but because as I say, I grew up with this being an aspiration, it kind of depressed me that so many people seem to think of, um, the world of writing, um, books as a kind of like way station to Hollywood. And like, what does that mean for this moment? What does it mean for the novel? Um, I, I think a lot more than when we were children, um, like the cultural conversation is much more screen oriented than it is text oriented. Um, and I know a lot of people who read a lot, but still um, almost inevitably when there's some kind of conversation about culture, and I should say that now most conversations seem to be about politics. They're not about culture, but when they are about culture, it's about like a great new TV show and not about a big new book. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
TV is a lot better than when we were kids. As a, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, that's pretty I, obvious. It's, it's, and it's, a lot is better. Yeah. yeah, a lot more literary. And yeah, people, right. novelists are often drawn into writers' room. Writing a novel to get into a writer's room seems like way too much work. You're like, you should, you should write a script, a script or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so the, I, yeah, I, I mean, the, I guess, I mean, it's always, yeah, I don't, I, I also do not foresee this being uh, turned into a major motion picture just because of the, you know, the kind of, Fair. it's, it's yeah. more of a novel. It's, it's internal. And uh, often good novels make bad movies and bad novels make good movies. Um, you know, famously the Godfather is like, a, just kind of a mediocre, you know, yeah. pop boiler kind of, kind of yeah. book. Okay. So you, you publish another piece that was in the Atlantic, um, a brief taxonomy of fictional academics. Uh, and this, this piece is about how, how, yeah, how academics and fiction kind of, you split them into two categories based on what they're studying. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is just kind of like a, it's supposed to be just kind of fun. It's lighthearted. Um, yeah, there's a, um, in Hedda Gabler, the Ibsen play, there's, um, two, uh, two characters who are rivals in many ways, among other things, for Hedda's affection. There's Hedda's husband, whose um, name is Tessman, and there's her former lover, who, whose name is Loveborg. And um, Tessman is writing a sort of like preposterously narrow book about, I think, I think it's the domestic industries of Brabant in the high middle ages or something or middle, you know, low middle ages, something like that. Um, and Loveborg is writing this sort of preposterously grandiose book that tries to take in 2000 years of history. And in the second part, like predict where civilization is going. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, it's like, what's going on is obvious and I think supposed to be funny. Um, and just to tell you kind of immediately who these characters are, that, that Tessman is kind of plodding and boring, but reliable. Uh, sorry. Yeah. That Tessman is boring and reliable. Um, and that love Borg is like brilliant, um, and extravagant and kind of a mess. Um, and, uh, I've, I've, like, I love that exchange just because I think it's so funny, like the domestic industries of Brabant. And, and, and also, I think, true to a certain form of academia, of, of contemporary academia, of just like hyper focused on on something like chipping away at something. Um, and uh, it seems to me that a lot of academics in campus fiction or academic fiction of some sort, like fall into one of those, these two categories. Either they're doing something like pretty narrow or they're doing something like hilariously grand. Um, and either way, the, the thing that they're working on kind of informs what this sort of character is, but it's just like a particular pleasure of mine when I'm reading that kind of fiction to like wait for that moment when you find out what the person is working on, uh, because it's always interesting and often it's played for laughs, um, especially when the person is on the, well, actually in both cases, like it can be played for laughs because it's so narrow or it can be played for laughs because it's so grand. Um, so, so the pieces about that, like, you know, in, um, in David Lodge's, um, changing places, Morris Zapp, who's, um, basically Stanley Fish, um, is, um, he, he became, famous by working on Jane Austen and his aspiration was to to write so comprehensively about Jane Austen to write about every possible angle that like nobody could ever say anything about Jane Austen again you know, so this is kind of like a classic Loveborg strategy of like I'm gonna say absolutely everything uh so your main character her dissertation on literary aspirations so that seems more like the impossible capacious um right thing were you, were you I mean did you have this split in mind when you were deciding what she what her area of study would be no in fact I, I didn't have it in mind um, but then when I was writing the piece I was like oh I guess probably my character must be one of these two and and what I sort of settle on is that she she she, she has this kind of love boring topic um, a history of inspiration what it's all about but what she lacks is the testman ability to just like sit down and work. So she, 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 she needs that a little bit. 
but she doesn't have it. Yeah, and yeah, and he, she's kind of presented as a she has like a character that's kind of her foil named Eric, I think, who's uh, Ed, who, yeah. who gets a um, who's a fellow PhD student and gets a, a offer of a of a job somewhere. And does he? Would, did, I can't remember what his <laughs> what his subject was, but I assume it's a little more realistic than. The yeah, of this, is, this is something fairly small. It's it's like moments of inspiration, moments of enlightenment, or something in mid century, mid twentieth century fiction. So oh, yeah, right. it's kind of like it's kind of um, achievable, focused thing. Right, and that's why he's interested in the Frederick Langley uh, notebooks as right. well. Um, yeah. So I think um, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, I would yeah. So if people are interested. <laughs> I'd recommend the novel. Buy it's, the book. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun read. <laughs> um, you're not going to see it on the big screen probably anytime soon, but um, so this is the only way you can <laughs> you can get the story. Um, and, Juliet, you are uh, at the Atlantic currently um, uh, as an editor there um, and oca- occasionally writing pieces. Um, anything else you want to mention before we wrap up? Mm, I don't think so, but this was really fun. Well, thank you for coming back on. Um, once you come on twice, you're officially a friend of the show. Um, oh, so you can, you know, make it that what you will. The most? You know, I think um, Katie Waldman has been on the most. I think she, yeah, she's been on three times at least. Um, yeah, she, she's, <laughs> she's a good guest as well. And a fellow, a fellow Yelly. Um, okay, so thank you, Juliet, for coming on. Uh, thanks to all of our viewers and listeners, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much. Bye.